Right. Uh, hello and uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 16th uh, Blue Arts Virtual Seminar. Uh, Blue Arts Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows health professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. And uh, this platform is brought to you by uh, Blue Arts Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And uh, we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm going to be your host, Adam Getacho. I'm the co-founder and CTO at Blue Ethiopia. And uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Mahalit Gabra Georgis here with us to give us an update on the approach and management of pancytopenia. And uh, Dr. Mahalit is an assistant professor of internal medicine, adult clinical uh, hematology fellow at CHS, Rambas Hospital. Uh, and it's uh, an honor to have you here with us. Thank you, Adam, for the warm welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone, again. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief talk about approach to pancytopenia. Uh, the talk is just going to last maximum 45 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time to uh, um, answer your questions and uh, any concerns or questions that you have from either your practice or from my presentation. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation. So uh, we'll start with introduction and defining uh, what pancytopenia is. Then we're going to look at uh, mechanism and the cause of pancytopenia. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, initial evaluation of patients, uh, of course, including history, physical examination, and uh, laboratory studies. Then uh, specifically on the management, since the management is going to be vast, we're just going to look at emergencies in patients presenting with pancytopenia and how to approach them. And then subsequent evaluation of patients, and we're going to look at specific uh, clinical scenarios. <clears throat> so, uh, when, uh, pancytopenia refers to decreases in all uh, peripheral blood lineages, uh, which includes uh, WBC, hemoglobin, and uh, platelets. And uh, many disorders that cause uh, pancytopenia also cause bicytopenia. So, our approach uh, is going to be similar as pancytopenia. Approach to pancytopenia is going to be similar as an approach to pancytopenia. Uh, and uh, when we're defining uh, uh, pancytopenia, uh, there are cutoff values that are going to be available from the institution, the laboratory, or from uh, published reference standards. Uh, generally, we, uh, the values from the institutional uh, cutoff uh, values are going to supersede those published reference standards, since these institutional cutoff values are standardized based on the population uh, that the institution serves. And uh, so we are going, the institutional cutoff values are going to supersede those of published uh, reference standards. WHO defines uh, cytopenia as, uh, as follows. So, Anemia would be defined as hemoglobin level less than 12 gram per deciliter for non-pregnant women and less than 13 gram per deciliter for adult men. And uh, leukopenia is going to be defined as total WBC count less than 4,000. But uh, since uh, almost uh, since uh, neutrophils make up majority of the WBCs, leukopenia is usually present with uh, uh, neutropenia. So absolute uh, neutrophil count less than 1,800 per microliter uh, defines uh, neutropenia. And uh, uh, thrombocytopenia is defined as platelet count less than 150,000 per microliter in adult uh, individuals. As you know, for uh, uh, children, for uh, adolescents, and for elderly patients, the definition of pancytopenia might differ, and also the definitions of cytopenia differ based on sex and race. Uh, in addition to uh, threshold levels for uh, pancytopenia differing based on age, sex, and race, uh, thresholds uh, may also differ based on uh, the specific uh, disease that we are uh, considering or diagnosing. For example, in patients who have um, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, the definition of uh, cytopenia is uh, different. For example, anemia is, uh, to use anemia as a criteria to diagnose myelodysplastic syndrome, hemoglobin level should be less than 10 gram per deciliter, platelet count should be less than 10,000. So uh, the threshold values may also differ based on uh, a specific uh, uh, disease condition. Uh, next, we're going to look at mechanism and cause of pancytopenia. We all know that in uh, healthy adults, uh, hematopoiesis uh, take place, takes place in the bone marrow, then mature blood cells migrate to the circulation, then uh, spleen and other uh, parts of our body. Uh, so there are going to be three mechanisms of uh, cytopenia uh, from the production, that is from the hematopoiesis uh, in the bone marrow, bone marrow infiltration and replacement is one mechanism, and other mechanism uh, affecting hematopoiesis would be bone marrow aplasia. 
uh, or hypoproliferative disorders and uh, other uh, causes going to be or other mechanism is going to be uh, peripheral sequestration or destruction of uh, blood cell components. So uh, uh, the first mechanism is bone marrow infiltration and replacement. So bone marrow infiltration and replacement occurs first in hematologic malignancies uh, like leukemia, acute leukemias, chronic leukemias, uh, either myeloid or lymphoproliferative disorders, lymphomas, multiple myeloma and myelodysplastic syndromes. In these conditions, bone marrow will be infiltrated by these malignant cells and this affects uh, normal production of hematopoietic cell components. Others are uh, metastatic cancers, uh, metastasis into the bone marrow, commonly carcinomas of the prostate, the breast, the gastrointestinal tract, the lung and the thyroid, and also the kidney, metastasized to the bone marrow, replacing the normal hematopoietic cells and um, uh, causing pancytopenia. Other causes of bone marrow infiltration and replacement are myelofibrosis. So myelofibrosis can be either primary myelofibrosis or a secondary myelofibrosis progressing from myeloproliferative disorders, uh, replacing the normal bone marrow components by a fibrous tissue and affecting uh, uh, hematopoiesis and causing pancytopenia. Other causes are infectious diseases where uh, infectious conditions disseminate to the bone marrow uh, and uh, either uh, uh, there's dissemination to the bone marrow and the inflammatory uh, or the immune components of our body uh, are going to be present in the bone marrow uh, and replacing the bone marrow and also releasing uh, cytokines affecting the normal hematopoiesis. So this includes disseminated TB, especially miliary TB and fungal infections uh, um, disseminating to the bone marrow. The second mechanism is bone marrow aplasia. So bone marrow aplasia is when the bone marrow um, uh, it's not replaced by or is not, there is no infiltration, but there is either uh, ineffective hematopoiesis or uh, the bone marrow uh, is hypoplastic due to different conditions. So one of the causes is nutritional disorders. So differences of vitamin B12 and folate cause megaloblastic anemia, where there is a delayed maturation of the nucleus compared to the cytoplasm. So this uh, cellular component, that is whether the WBC, the um, RBCs or the platelets, are not uh, functional. So this is due to ineffective erythropoiesis because vitamin B12 and folate are important for uh, development or formation of the nuclear components. So uh, uh, this is one cause. Even though it says bone marrow aplasia, these nutritional disorders do not technically cause a hypocellular bone marrow. They cause a hypercellular bone marrow, but the cellular components are uh, destroyed in the bone marrow. Uh, uh, the second cause of bone marrow aplasia is aplastic anemia where um, uh, yeah, the immune system of a uh, patient with aplastic anemia uh, 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 attacks the hematopoietic stem cells where the bone marrow is going to be replaced by the fat globules and uh, so the bone marrow is severely hypocellular and patients will present with pancytopenia. Other cause of bone marrow aplasia are infections, infectious diseases like HIV, uh, viral hepatitis and parvovirus. Uh, these uh, diseases uh, invoke or they lead to immune uh, reactions uh, and this immu uh, immune uh, Immune component cells will release cytokines in the bone marrow, affecting the normal hematopoiesis and uh, leading to bone marrow aplasia. Other causes of bone marrow aplasia are medications. Uh, medications like uh, anti seizure medications like carbamazepine, uh, common antibiotics that use like sulfonamide, scoramphenicol, um, anti thyroid medications like metimazole, pro, uh, PTU, and other drugs uh, can lead to either a predictable type of uh, cytopenia or uh, idiosyncratic reactions that lead to development of aplastic anemia. So these are the differential diagnosis or the causes of uh, bone marrow aplasia. Uh, another mechanism of uh, pancytopenia is blood cell destruction or sequestration. So um, uh, in this mechanism, uh, either the components of the uh, the components of the, per the, the blood, that is the WBCs, the, the RBCs and the platelets, either will be destroyed, prematurely destroyed by um, either the immune system or other uh, different mechanisms, or they are sequestered in the spleen because of hyperspleenism. So uh, uh, immature or uh, increased destruction of uh, cell components of the blood can occur in disseminated intravascular coagulation and TTP, where um, there is a peripheral consumption of uh, coagulation factors and also platelets. So the consumption of platelet leads to thrombocytopenia and then uh, due to the formation of multiple uh, thrombus and also the fibrin or the fibrogen present in the thrombus, will lead to destruction of the RBCs and cause anemia. So uh, differential diagnosis for blood uh, cell destruction peripheral will be disseminated in intravascular coagulation and TTPHS. 
Uh, other uh, mechanism of blood cell destruction is, like I mentioned earlier, when there is uh, ineffective hematopoiesis, as in case of megaloblastic disorders, where there is delayed maturation of the uh, nucleus of the nuclear component of the WBCs, RBCs, and the platelets, and in mitral dysplastic syndromes, these cells will be ineffective or they're not uh, functional. So our body will destroy the cells in the bone marrow, and they will be destroyed in the intramedullary, and uh, uh, the, the destruction occurs in the bone marrow, it leads to pancytopenia. Uh, the other mechanism, as I've said, is sequestration due to hyperspinism. So as we know, hyperspinism can occur either due to liver cirrhosis, storage diseases, and lymphomas, specifically um, uh, the low-grade lymphomas in hyperactive malarial splenomegaly, in hepatosplenic schistosomiasis, or other autoimmune disorders, where there is um, enlargement of the spleen and sequestration of these blood cell components in the spleen leading to pancytopenia. So uh, the, mechanism, the mechanisms we mentioned earlier include, uh, to summarize them, in the bone marrow, the, there might be replacement of the bone marrow by either malignant cells or by fibrosis or by infectious uh, conditions. Uh, and also bone marrow aplasia can occur due to aplastic anemia medications or infections and also uh, ineffective uh, erythropoiesis. And then finally, uh, peripheral destruction and sequestration will be the causes. But, Several mechanisms can also occur. Uh, some diseases can also cause pancytopenia by multifactorial mechanisms. For example, in lymphomas, especially endoglade lymphomas, uh, there is commonly infiltration of the bone marrow leading to uh, pancytopenia because of replacement of the bone marrow. Then they can also cause splenomegaly, and uh, this splenomegaly can lead to hyperspinism, uh, where there is increased sequestration of the blood components in the spleen. Or they can also lead to immune dysfunction, uh, inducing immune destruction of the blood cells, causing ITP and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, causing by cytopenia. Uh, and also, these lymphomas are going to require treatment with cytotoxic agents, which cause uh, predictive response of myelosuppression and causing pancytopenia. Other example is, for example, in Crohn's disease, where there is impairment of uh, uh, essential vitamins like folate and vitamin B12. Uh, because of malabsorption, this leads to development of uh, either monocytopenia or bicytopenia or pancytopenia. And also this disease condition is also an inflammatory condition or an inflammatory state, and it exacerbates uh, the presence of anemia. And then when we're treating Crohn's disease, for example, with partial or uh, partial bowel uh, resection, this also affects the sites for absorption of nutrients and calories. So, and also these diseases are going to require treatment with myelosuppressive agents, and this leads to pancytopenia. So in an individual patient, a, sing, a certain disease or a, some disease might, might cause pancytopenia because of multifactorial reasons. So when we come to uh, approaching the patient or evaluating the patient, so uh, the goal of initial evaluation of the patient by non-hematologists, non-hematologist clinician is going to be uh, narrowing down the differential diagnosis uh, for because we have, as we mentioned, we are just have, we have just mentioned only a small amount of examples for the cause of the pancytopenia. There are vast uh, or numerous possible cause of the pancy pancytopenia. So the purpose of initial evaluation with history, physical examination in laboratories is going to be uh, narrowing down the differential diagnosis. And the second purpose of initial evaluation is going to be identifying emergency situations. Uh, that determines the need for in urgent admission and uh, also they are going to guide the urgency of uh, hematology referral. Uh, from the history, uh, things that we should focus for are first the time course and the clinical severity of uh, the disease. So the time course and the clinical severity is going to help you first in narrowing down your differential diagnosis. So if it's, for example, an acute presentation, you're going to think of disease that cause acute pancytopenia, like acute leukemia. Uh, in severely ill patients, for example, acute development of pancytopenia, especially in hospitalized patients, can occur with folate deficiency. Um, other uh, aggressive lymphomas uh, like uh, Burkitt's lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, usually present with acute presentation. So it's going to narrow down your differential diagnosis, and also it will help you uh, to uh, to gauge the clinical or the severity of the disease. Right. So if the patient has a very severe uh, cytopenia. Uh, with a rapid progression of disease, so you, it's going to guide um, the timing of referral to hematologist or whether the patient needs to be admitted. So uh, you can outright ask about uh, the onset of symptoms, or if the patient has available prior laboratory results, you can uh, accurately uh, decide when the uh, cytopenia started. Uh, other part of the history we should focus on are uh, symptoms associated with the cytopenias. So uh, these are uh, the things that we commonly see. So a patient with leukopenia and neutropenia is going to be predisposed to develop infections. So 
patients having recurrent severe or unusual uh, infections, you should ask about uh, any recent infection. So you should focus on, say, say, ask the patient if the patient has fever or uh, specifically focus on the uh, organs that can be involved with infection and ask about these symptoms. So we can ask about respiratory symptoms, GI symptoms, GU symptoms uh, for the, any signs of infection. Uh, then um, uh, for the symptoms of anemia, uh, you, we know the symptoms of anemia like fatigue, tinnitus, uh, postural hypotension, syncope, shortness of breath, uh, claudication, uh, uh, um, chest pain are going to be symptoms of anemia. Uh, we should ask about these symptoms and also gauge the severity of the symptoms. For example, if the patient has chest pain, hemodynamic instability, like postural hypotension symptoms, you're going to need to transfuse the patient, admit the patient for emergency management. Uh, the other is uh, symptoms of thrombocytopenia or DIC. So you should ask about any bleeding from any side of the body. So for the thrombocytopenia, we're going to need to ask about um, mucocutaneous bleeding. So from any mucocutaneous areas, we should ask about that and also easy bruising. Would be asked. Uh, then the next is the presence of constitutional symptoms. So these constitutional symptoms like fever, night sweats, and or weight loss uh, should be assessed in the patient. Uh, they are going to try. They, we, they can help us in narrowing down the differential diagnosis, and also they are going to be the the ones guiding. Uh, they can also help us in guiding therapy and also investigating the patient. Other symptoms are uh, nausea, vomiting, and jaundice, uh, which might be associated with the presence of liver disease and liver cirrhosis. So they should be inquired. Other is the uh, um, presence of previous treatments. Uh, so uh, previous treatments are important. For example, in a patient uh, receiving past, for example, uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, first we can think of as a recurrence of disease or these therapies like chemotherapy and radiotherapy can lead to development of secondary malignancy. So it should be asked in the history. And also past history of uh, treatment with uh, hematinics like uh, vitamin B12 and folate should be asked. Uh, in order to guide our differential diagnosis and also to see if which treatments have failed before. So this should be inquired in the history. So other medical conditions should also be asked, comorbidities that the patient has. Uh, so any, almost any comorbidities can also, uh, medical, either medical or surgical condition can uh, contribute to or exacerbate the cytopenia that the patient has. And also it's going to guide our further uh, investigation in therapy. So for example, a patient requiring for, um, um, chemotherapy or uh, patients requiring transplantation, for example, having significant comorbidities might preclude uh, the patient from getting this therapy. So this should, uh, this, uh, other medical should, condition should be inquired. Uh, the other thing we've talked about is uh, medications that can cause pancytopenia, either cause pancytopenia or exacerbate uh, pancytopenia that the patient has. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, there is a long list of uh, drugs that can cause uh, pancytopenia, but we should ask um, over-the-counter medication, prescribed medication, health supplements, uh, and also traditional uh, remedies that the patient is using. Uh, and also, uh, if the patient is taking a drug, then we should um, uh, ask uh, the temporary relationship between the initiation of the drug and uh, uh, the onset of pancytopenia symptoms. Uh, like I've mentioned earlier, for example, a patient taking myelosuppressive drugs will have a predictable response. So uh, uh, usually uh, patients will have uh, development of pancytopenia after cytotoxic medication within seven to, seven to 14 days. But in patients uh, taking, for example, chloramphenicol, uh, there might be a idiosyncratic reaction where uh, the drug has been discontinued for a while and the patient develops a plastic anemia and pancytopenia. So that temporary relationship between the, uh, the initiation of the drug and uh, the development of pancytopenia symptoms should be uh, determined. Other part of uh, history that we should inquire is uh, the personal and uh, occupational exposures of the patient. Uh, so uh, these are the ones that are going to contribute to the cause of the differential diagnosis that we've mentioned earlier. So personal habit of the patient, alcohol consumption, which can lead to liver cirrhosis, causing portal hypertension, splenomegaly, and causing pancytopenia or uh, alcohol can also cause uh, deficiency of essential vitamins leading to megaloblastic anemia. Other are uh, dietary habits of the individual, uh, like for example, a patient uh, on um, uh, um, exclusive uh, vegan diet, even though we don't see this uh, usually, exclusive vegan diet is going to develop uh, cyanocobalamin deficiency and megaloblastic anemia. Uh, the other we should ask about is past history of HIV diagnosis, viral hepatitis. If the patient is taking medications for these diseases, should be inquired. Other is the exposure to toxic agents. We can ask about the occupation of the individual uh, and uh, see if the occupation uh, has um, 
uh, chemicals or other uh, other um, agents that can lead to pancytopenia. For example, uh, organic solvents like benzene, for example, can uh, predispose patients to development of acute myeloid leukemia. The other is travel history or uh, residence in an area where uh, malaria is endemic and also uh, visceral leishmaniasis uh, is also endemic. So we should ask about travel history or residence in areas where these diseases are endemic. Uh, so on physical examination, we're going to do a full physical examination, uh, obviously for every patient that we're going to see, but there are some certain, th there are certain things that we should focus on. Uh, so uh, we should focus on features of cytopenia on physical examination. Uh, we know that features of anemia like uh, palmal pallor, uh, pale conjunctiva, uh, and features of thrombocytopenia like PKK, chemosis, um, any um, uh, any uh, like uh, weight purpura in the oral cavity, uh, conjunctival hemorrhage that uh, uh, signal uh, an impending clinically significant bleeding uh, should be looked at. Uh, and also uh, for the leukopenia, you're going to have to focus on, for example, for the chest for any size of infection uh, uh, and also the gastrointestinal and the genital area. Uh, other uh, features that you're going to find on physical examination that are going to be used for your uh, diagnosis are, for example, rashes that can uh, be related to either drug reaction, rheumatologic conditions, uh, infections, and also malignancies, either involving the uh, skin or uh, other complications uh, or skin conditions that can occur in leukemia and lymphomas. Uh, oral regions, uh, for example, the presence of oral trash is going to suggest immunocompromisation, and uh, they can also be seen in this like systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, the presence of lymphadenopathy uh, and uh, hepatoman organomegaly, like splenomegaly and hepatomegaly, uh, can be seen in uh, lymphomas, leukemia, autoimmune condition, in infectious conditions. So these areas should also be specifically examined. The other is uh, looking for jaundice and stigma of liver disease uh, because one of our differential diagnoses was uh, liver cirrhosis. Okay, so uh, initial laboratory studies that uh, we need to do uh, as, uh, as patients present to us with uh, past cytopenia are uh, doing CBC with uh, WBC and differentials and RBC, uh, RBC indices. Uh, the other are examination of the peripheral blood smear, uh, which is going to help us uh, to look at any abnormal cells that are going to be present, like blasts or any plastic change that we can see in the peripheral morphology, and also um, confirming. Uh, uh, the pancytopenia for the automated count is going to tell us that the patient has pancytopenia and you're going to actually confirm or uh, visually uh, evaluate for the presence of leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia. And uh, the other is doing the reticulocyte count. So doing the reticulocyte count, so reticulocytes are um, RBC precursors. Normally, uh, the uh, large amounts of them should not be released uh, from the bone marrow to the periphery. Uh, and uh, uh, if the, there is a large amount of them released from, to the periphery, that means that the bone marrow is uh, reacting very well to um, uh, anemia or any cytopenia. And if the patient has a low level of reticulocyte, uh, low reticulocyte count, where absolute reticulocyte count is less than 20,000, this indicates that the bone marrow is not responding and it might suggest the presence of hypoproliferative condition it, and it will narrow your uh, differential diagnosis. The other is doing coagulation profile. Uh, we're going to discuss it, discuss, discuss this further. So uh, doing PT, PTT, PTT and INR is going to be important. So in patients having pancytopenia and coagulopathy, your differential diagnosis is going to narrow. So maybe you're going to think of uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia with the presence of DIC, or you're just going to think of uh, DIC with uh, bicytopenia uh, involving anemia and thrombocytopenia with either lipocytosis or leukopenia. Other uh, investigations that we're going to need to do are serum chemistry tests, uh, including electrolytes, organ function tests. Uh, electrolytes should also include the calcium and the phosphate level, liver function tests, selected dehydrogenase, and uric acid levels. Uh, these are very important because uh, many causes that we have talked about are associated with, uh, many causes for the pancytopenia are associated with derangement of uh, these parameters. And also they are going to guide whether you need to uh, admit the patient for emergency management, or how urgently you're going to uh, refer or consult uh, hematology. The other thing we need to do is blood group and RH, including uh, blood group and RH, and also screening for hepatitis B, C, and HIV. <clears throat> uh, so uh, we're going to look at emergencies where you need to uh, either 
uh, urgently refer or consult hematology side or admit the patient for emergency management. Uh, so while evaluating the patients, as we as I've said earlier, uh, one of the goals of initial evaluation is to identify emergent conditions because they are the most uh, prior, uh, this is our priority to identify the patients who are who need emergent treatment and uh, stabilize the patient. So um, uh, immediate hospitalization for patients with pancytopenia might be required to control life-threatening infections, uh, pro provide blood product support, or manage other medical emergencies. So conditions that require emergent management or urgent referral or consultation of hematology include, first is uh, the presence of neutropenia, so absolute neutrophil count uh, less than 1,000 with uh, fever or uh, in or any signs or evidence of infection is going to need urgent or in, uh, urgent admission and uh, in rapid initiation of uh, treatment for the neutropenic fever. And also we're going to need uh, urgent consultation from the hematology side. The other is new diagnosis of moderate to severe neutropenia. So any patient with newly diagnosed uh, neutropenia, are moderate or severe, moderate is going to be less than 1,000 and severe is going to be less than 5,000. So in these patients, we're going to need urgent uh, consultation from the hematology side. Uh, the other is, uh, the other uh, emergent condition is uh, the presence of symptomatic anemia. Uh, so, uh, talking about the threshold for transfusion indications for transfusion uh, is going to be a vast discussion and might depend on the cause of the anemia, but any patient having symptomatic anemia, meaning presence of uh, myocardial ischemia with chest pain, orthostatic hypotension, dyspnea, uh, is going to need uh, um, an uh, emergent uh, transfusion with uh, packed RBC. And uh, generally, uh, in our patients, for example, with hematologic malignancies and uh, patients who are going to receive chemotherapy, we use the hemoglobin threshold value of less than or equal to seven to transfuse patients with packed RBC. Otherwise, any patient with anemia who has uh, symptoms like MI, uh, orthostatic hypotension, and dyspnea is going to require uh, transfusion. The other is uh, thrombocytopenia. So a new finding of platelet less than 10,000 or Clinically significant bleeding with platelet less than 50,000 is going to need uh, transfusion with platelets and also uh, consultation and also uh, if available, hematologists available or a referral, urgent referral to hematologists. The other uh, em emergency condition is uh, suspected uh, DIC or TTPHUS uh, in these conditions. Uh, so these are life-threatening life conditions and also organ-threatening conditions. So they are going to require prompt uh, admission and also uh, consultation from the hematology side or hematology referral after stabilization of the patient. Uh, other uh, condition that's going to uh, require uh, admission and also hematology consultation is new diagnosis of acute leukemia. Uh, so you might see patients with pancytopenia with features suggestive of acute leukemia. In addition, you might look at the peripheral morphology and C plus in that condition, uh, the patient is going to require referral to hematologist. The other is uh, the one that requires um, emergency treatment and admission is um, medical emergencies associated with leukemia, like DIC in acute promyelocytic leukemia uh, and also tumor lysis syndrome, either in leukemia or Burkitt's lymphoma or other aggressive lymphomas like diffuse large vessel lymphoma. Uh, other emergencies, uh, suspected severe aplastic anemia. So this is a definition for the severe aplastic anemia where uh, absolute neutrophil count is less than 500 that less than 20,000 anemia with reticulocyte count uh, of less than 20,000 is going to require urgent uh, referral to hematologist and uh, urgent initiation of treatment for the aplastic anemia. The other is uh, suspected uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis. This is a rare condition, it's not common, but uh, uh, when you haven't found a clear uh, cause for the pancytopenia and you have unexplained fever, the patient has hepatomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and also neurologic symptoms associated with elevated serum ferritin level and elevated uh, uh, triglyceride levels, uh, abnormal liver function tests, uh, and also additional presence of uh, coagulopathy. These patients might have uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis. This disease can be either primary or secondary. You don't need to know the details about it, or you can read uh, about it uh, in your own time. But this disease condition is correct. Uh, can be primary or secondary. It can occur secondary to uh, leukemias, aggressive lymphomas, or infections, or it can occur as a primary condition. So in this condition, there is a persistent activation of the immune cell component where the macrophages are consistently activated and they will uh, phagocytosize RBCs uh, and lead to this kind of uh, reactions. Other emergency condition that is going to require uh, emergent treatment and admission and also referral to hematologists is going to be 
hypercalcemia, severe hypercalcemia or hypercalcemia associated with symptoms like delirium, abdominal pain, and dehydration. In these cases, uh, of course, hypercalcemia can occur either with multiple myeloma, for example, because uh, there are there are activation of certain cytokines that lead to activation of osteoclasts and uh, leading to the release of uh, calcium and causing hypercalcemia, metastatic cancers to the bone, and uh, also uh, adult TCA leukemia, lymphoma can lead to hypercalcemia, and in this condition, this is going to require urgent treatment uh, because it's life threatening. So uh, it's going to require emergency admission. The other is the presence of acute, acute renal failure associated with pancytopenia, which can occur as, uh, for example, in acute leukemia, as tumor lysis syndrome, or uh, it can occur in case, for example, in multiple myeloma due to different mechanisms. One of them would be hypercalcemia. Other mechanism would be the presence of hyperuricemia. Uh, other mechanisms are uh, light chain deposition disease. In these conditions, patients are going to require uh, uh, urgent admission. The other is uh, the presence of hyperuricemia with uh, renal failure, plus the presence of pancytopenia is going to require uh, urgent admission and uh, immediate treatment for the uh, immediate use of agents to lower the uric acid levels and uh, management of acute renal failure. <clears throat> So, uh, so you have narrowed down your differential diagnosis with your initial evaluation, and you have also picked up the emergency conditions in patients who have these uh, conditions and admitted them. So uh, I'm going to say brief points about uh, the hematology referral. So um, normally, uh, commonly, you're going to see, um, you might see patients with clear cause for the pancytopenia that uh, patient you can manage without the presence of the hematologist, for example. Uh, patients with pancytopenia due to megaloblastic anemia, patients with pancytopenia associated with hypersplenism, for example, caused by uh, hyperactive malarial splenomegaly, can be managed uh, by a non specialist clinician. Uh, otherwise, uh, in conditions where you haven't found treatable conditions or uh, you haven't uh, promptly identified the cause of the pancytopenia, referral to hematologist is going to be indicated. The reason why you're going to refer the patient, well, the patient to a hematologist will be. Uh, to do the specialized tests uh, required and also interpretation of the specialized tests required to diagnose the cause of the pancytopenia and also for the management of the patient. And as I've said earlier, the urgency of referral to hematologist is going to be influenced by the severity of uh, the, the cytopenia and how rapidly the cytopenia is progressing, uh, the clinical stability of the patient, whether there are medical complications like infections or metabolic complications, this is going to guide your uh, urgency uh, of referral to hemology. So like I've said earlier, in emergencies, you're going to need uh, urgent referral, but in a stable patient where uh, the cytopenia is mild and it's progressing uh, slowly in this condition, uh, and there are no medical emergency emergencies mentioned earlier, uh, you can follow the, C the CBC serially while you're investigating the patient, for example, while you're reviewing the peripheral morphology. So um, subsequent evaluation. Uh, so I'm going to mention brief points uh, in patients uh, who in the in patients with pancytopenia in their subsequent evaluation. So um, doing bone marrow aspiration. Bone marrow aspiration uh, is usually helpful uh, in many patients or in most of the patients with pancytopenia, but not all patients benefit for, from bone marrow evaluation. Uh, so as uh, if you can remember, so the mechanisms of pancytopenia mentioned earlier, both of the disorders have uh, uh, two of the mechanisms involved the bone marrow. So in this condition, evaluating the bone marrow is important to identify the cause. But when there is, um, for example, the cause of the pancytopenia is peripheral sequestration due to hyperspinism, due to either liver cirrhosis, hepatosplenic histosomiasis, uh, due to malaria, and these conditions, the bone marrow evaluation is not important. Uh, you can uh, identify the cause based on prior investigations that uh, I have mentioned earlier. So um, bone marrow evaluation is going to be important in patients where we think the primary uh, or the cause of the pancytopenia is primary hematologic disorder, meaning bone marrow disorders, either due to uh, malignancies or uh, bone marrow aphasias, uh, like acute leukemia, plastic anemia, multiple myeloma. In these conditions, bone marrow evaluation is going to be important. Or when the cause of the pancytopenia uh, remains elusive after initial evaluation. Uh, while you're not thinking that the primary cause is not a hematologic disorder and you have done your investigations initially and you couldn't find the cause of the pancytopenia, then you might, to, you might need to do a bone marrow aspiration. And the urgency is going to be guided by the prior parameters that you've mentioned. So after you've sent the bone marrow, the bone marrow is going to uh, undergo microscopic ex examination by hematopathologists if present. You only have one in Addis, and then if 
there is no hematopathologist present. A pathologist uh, with uh, a hematologist is going to uh, evaluate the bone marrow aspiration and the biopsy. And uh, based on your uh, morphologic evaluation of the bone marrow aspiration and also the morphologic evaluation of the peripheral morphology, your differential diagnosis for the pancytopenia, the differential diagnosis you have for the pancytopenia based on this evaluation is going to guide whether you're going to do further uh, specialized tests like flow cytometry. Uh, flow cytometry, if you know, is um, uh, technically detects uh, antigen present in the cell surface or in the cytoplasm of the cells to identify uh, which cells are there. For example, for acute uh, myeloid leukemia, so morphologically, we see the peripheral morphology and the bone marrow, and we think we have seen blasts. So uh, we, will go, we will send a flow cytometry, which will differentiate between uh, acute myeloid leukemia and acute uh, uh, ALL. And then from the ALS, ALL, it's going to differentiate whether it's B cell ALL or T cell ALL. Uh, and there, there are cytogenetics, you're going to do karyotyping. Cytogenetics means uh, either karyotyping or Lorentz C2 hybridization, where we try to identify chromosomal abnormalities, like translocations, for example, well, you know, translocation is a Philadelphia chromosome, where there is translocation of uh, chromosome 9 and uh, translocation uh, between chromosome 9 and 22. So there are, these cytogenetic studies are helpful in diagnosis. They are also helpful in prognosticating patients and also uh, guiding management for management for patients. Other studies are molecular studies where try, we try to detect uh, mutations uh, with similar prognostic, therapeutic, and uh, diagnostic values as cytogenetics. Other are doing microbiology culture if we think uh, the cause of the pancytopenia is associated with infection. <clears throat> so we're going to see specific uh, clinical scenarios. So uh, the first specific clinical scenario is the presence of coagulopathy with pancytopenia. So if the patient has pancytopenia plus deranged coagulation uh, studies or coagulopathy, uh, the first thing you should focus on is uh, the one that is life-threatening is the presence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is the presence of anemia plus uh, schistocytes that is uh, fragmented RBCs in the peripheral morphology, two to three fragmented RBCs in the peripheral morphology, and the presence of microangiopathic an hemolytic anemia should, of course, uh, raise the possibility of diffuse intravascular coagulation, either uh, associated with sepsis or cause of diffuse intravascular coagulation, or uh, should also guide uh, our differential diagnosis to acute promyelocytic leukemia. So in acute promyelocytic leukemia, for example, patients, uh, if treatment is not started early, where coagulopathy is detected and uh, a differentiation agent is not started for the acute promyelocytic leukemia, 50% of patients will get to the IC. So, uh, the presence of uh, coagulosis with pancytopenia first rule out emergency condition or life threatening conditions like DIC either associated with sepsis, associated with trauma, associated with surgeries, or whatever, or acute promyelocytic leukemia. So if you can, if you didn't find microangiopathic hemolytic anemia associated with uh, deranged coagulopathy, then you should look for other cause of uh, deranged uh, uh, coagulation uh, study with pancytopenia, like liver disease vitamin K deficiency and medications. And based on the differential diagnosis that you're thinking of for the rearrangement of, uh, for the coagulopathy, either uh, factor level determination or mixing studies are going to be needed. The other uh, clinical scenario is finding abnormal cells on the blood, peripheral blood smear associated with the pancytopenia. So you have evaluated the patient and you have looked at the peripheral morphology and you have looked, uh, you have found abnormal cells. So, if you, uh, the abnormal cells can either be due to us, due to hematologic malignancies uh, or due to bone marrow replacement disorder or megaloblastic conditions usually. So these are the three conditions where you see abnormal cells in the perif peripheral blood smear. In malignancies, uh, circulating bloods are going to be seen in patients with leukemia, either acute leukemia or acute LL or AML. Um, uh, you're going to see dysplastic leukocytes like pseudopegular Hewlett cells. Uh, these are hyposegmented neutrophils with uh, reduced cytoplasmic granules in the periphery that are seen in myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, you can see immature myeloid cells uh, or myeloid precursors like promyelocytes, myelocytes, and metamyelocytes that uh, might indicate the presence of myeloproliferative neoplasms. And you can see leukoerythroblastic findings. Leukoerythroblastic finding is defined by the presence of nucleated RBCs drop RBCs and myeloid precursors in the periphery, and this can be seen in case of myelofibrosis and MPA. So these are uh, some pictures. So I'm thinking you're going to be uh, 
you practice doing your peripheral morphologies, uh, undergrad, we practice it during undergrad and also during residency. So uh, wherever you are uh, practicing your medicine, doing peripheral morphology and evaluating its microscope is, av if available, uh, uh, is very important. So you might see blasts. Uh, for example, um, this is a myeloblast. Uh, blasts will be characterized by the presence of increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. ratio. As you can see, the nucleus is very big and you can compare it to a normal cell over here, uh, or maybe a reactive lymphocyte, which has a compact uh, nucleus, as you can see. Uh, it's much more uh, compared to uh, the nucleus of the blast. As you can see, the nucleus of the blast is lighter than um, uh, the nucleus of a normal cell. Uh, in addition to that, you might see nucleolysis. These white spots are nucleolysis because the chromatin is open. It will open and uh, show the underlying nucleoli present. So, these whitish spots are going to be nucleus, and the ones that show the arrows are uh, auros and they are pathognomic or AML. So you might see plus in the periphery. This is uh, the other uh, abnormal cell that I've mentioned earlier, this pseudopegular Hewlett cell. Normally neutrophils are supposed to have three or more uh, uh, nuclear lobules, but this has two lobes and uh, the, the segment connecting these lobules is very thin. And also, uh, it's uh, like normal neutrophils, this cell doesn't have uh, uh, granules in the cytoplasm. So this is a dysplastic neutrophil and might be indicative of MDS. The other one I have, uh, have told you about is the presence of uh, leukoerythroblastic fissure. This is a nucleated RBC. Uh, it's not supposed to be present in the periphery because nucleated RBCs are supposed to be present in the bone marrow during development of RBCs. But when the uh, bone marrow is either replaced by um, uh, uh, fibrosis or uh, uh, an extensive myeloptysis, uh, uh, there will be early re release of RBCs to the periphery, nucleated RBCs to the periphery. And also uh, in myeloproliferative neoplasms, there will also be presence of myeloid precursors. This is a promyelocyte, uh, myelocyte, and also uh, metamyelocyte in the periphery. These are uh, precursors of neutrophils in the periphery. Myeloid. The other abnormal cells we see in the periphery are uh, non-malignant cells, for example, like hypersegmented neutrophils. Hypersegmented neutrophils are going to be defined as five or more nuclear lobes uh, of uh, neutrophils in association with, uh, in association with uh, macro ovalocytes. These are large or enlarged RBCs, which are ovoid and suggest the presence of megaloblastic anemia. So in, uh, in this condition, your investigation is going to be uh, directed at uh, investigating for megaloblastic anemia. So whether the patient has folate or uh, vitamin B12 deficiency by uh, doing folate uh, levels uh, from the serum and uh, vitamin B12 levels from the serum or biochemical tests like methyl manolic acid and homocysteine levels might be you might need to be measured. And also you're going to investigate for the cause of uh, megaloblastic anemia. Other abnormal and malignant cells that you're going to see in the periphery are atypical lymphocytes. Uh, so these are commonly seen in uh, infections, viral infections, like, for example, infectious monolecrosis causing pancytopenia associated with either hypersplenism or bone marrow suppression due to release of cytokines from the reactive lymphocytes. So these atypical lymphocytes uh, have like uh, generous uh, cytoplasm compared to normal lymphocytes, and they are often surrounded by RBCs. So this is a hypersegmented neutrophil containing, I think, un one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe a seven segment over here, but it has a six segment at least. And these are um, reactive lymphocytes. Normally, lymphocytes are supposed to have uh, cytoplasm like this or through a rim of cytoplasm throughout, but uh, these have a much more generous cytoplasm than normal uh, lymphocytes. Uh, this is not uh, typical RBC surrounding the lymphocytes. They are much more closer uh, in a typical case, but these are reactive lymphocytes. So the, you're going to think of uh, uh, viral disease in this condition, for example, if you see peripheral morphology and see these cells. The other specific clinical scenario is the presence of pancytopenia uh, with hypoproliferative conditions. So in these conditions, like I've said earlier, hypoproliferative conditions might be suggested by the presence of reticulocytopenia, whereas the absolute reticulocyte count is less than 20,000. Uh, so in these patients who have, like, like for example, low reticulocyte count, when you see the patient, then uh, whether you, the urgency of your uh, further evaluation is going to be guided by, like I've said earlier, the severity and the trajectory of the cytopenia, and whether you have suspected severe aplastic anemia in this patient. So if the patient has uh, severe, uh, severe aplastic anemia features like uh, the low end, the end seal values and the platelet counts mentioned here, 
you're going to need to uh, rapidly uh, refer the patient to a hematologist or consult the hematology side. Otherwise, if uh, the causes for hypoproliferative condition, as we've said earlier, are megaloblastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, medications, and infections. So your investigation is going to be uh, like this. Uh, so uh, investigation is going to be test vitamin B12 and folate deficiencies, and uh, we're going to look at causes for uh, uh, pancytopenia like alcohol associated with either liver cirrhosis or with deficiency of essential vitamins or the presence of infections. If these are not present, uh, then further testing is going to be required. During this condition, you're going to refer the patient to a hematologist or order this investigation. So these further investigations are, for example, bone marrow aspiration in biopsy to rule out aplastic anemia, or if we're considering or if we haven't ruled out acute leukemia, we might need to do immunostochemical stu studies either to rule out acute leukemia or to rule out uh, any low-grade lymphomas. You, you might need to do flow cytometry or other specialized testing. Or the other differential diagnoses are viral etiologies or autoimmune illnesses. So you might need to consult the ID side or the rheumatology side together, and you might need to investigate for the cause of pancytopenia. Uh, the other is the presence of uh, spinal or liver disease uh, associated with pancytopenia. So the cause of uh, pancytopenia plus splenomegaly are First is uh, liver, liver cirrhosis with portal hypertension. Other cause of splenomegaly presenting with pancytopenia are infections like viral infections, like, like I've mentioned earlier, infectious monoleculosis, EBV, malaria, uh, malaria or HSM, Lish, visceral leishmaniasis uh, are uh, differential diagnosis from infectious causes, hematologic malignancies, lymphomas, specifically low grade lymphomas, hericell leukemia, myeloproliferative neoplasms cause splenomegaly with pancytopenia. Those are uh, extramedullary hematopoiesis, meaning the hematopoiesis occurs outside the bone marrow because uh, there is something happening in the bone marrow. Either the bone marrow is replaced by fibrosis or um, uh, the patient has a plastic anemia, so my, uh, my thalassemia. So the <coughs> hematopoiesis can occur in extramedullary sites, mainly in the spleen, in the liver. Uh, so the first one to, to be enlarged would be the spleen. Uh, the other cause of spleen omega is pancytopenia, congestion of uh, the spleen due to right-sided heart failure, uh, and uh, inflammation associated with either uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, or uh, other autoimmune illnesses. So uh, your history physical examination uh, is going to guide you in narrowing differential diagnosis in patients with spleen omega and uh, pancytopenia. Sorry, this is a mix-up. Sorry, um, and... Um, if uh, the patient, if you have, uh, so you can rule out uh, the infectious condition, you can rule out liver cirrhosis, you can rule out uh, uh, the causes from history, physical examination, and initial evaluation. Uh, but uh, if, uh, for example, the patient has splenomegaly and plus lymphadenopathy, your differential diagnosis is also going to be different. So uh, your further evaluation is going to be also guided by uh, your differential diagnosis. Uh, the other is uh, the presence of lymphadenopathy with pancytopenia. So finding of lymphadenopathy with pancytopenia, potential differential diagnosis are going to be hematologic malignancies, either lymphomas or leukemias, autoimmune illnesses like uh, sarcoidosis, SLE, can cause lymphadenopathy and pancytopenia, or, uh, the other are infectious diseases. For example, like HIV uh, can lead to generalized lymphadenopathy with pancytopenia. So your differential diagnosis are going to be this. So uh, further investigations you might do in a patient with pancytopenia plus lymphadenopathy, might be imaging studies uh, to further um, define the extent of lymphadenopathy, either using CT scan, ultrasound, or PET scan. So in uh, lymphomas, for example, like in um, uh, Hodgkin and Hodgkin lymphomas, PET scans have replaced uh, CT scans. Uh, uh, in our setup, we use CT scans uh, to uh, define the extent of disease, for example, in lymphomas. So uh, imaging is going to be an adjunct investigation that you're going to do. Other investigations you might need are uh, lymph node biopsy, it, uh, so, <clears throat> and you might send the lymph node biopsy for morphology, immunostochemistry, molecular studies. Uh, lymph, so, not all patients presenting with uh, lymphadenopathy require lymph node biopsy. For example, patients with acute leukemia um, having either pancytopenia or bicytopenia with leukocytosis and lymphadenopathy can be present. It doesn't mean you don't need to do lymph node biopsy in every patient. So, you might need to do lymph node biopsy in patients where you're suspecting lymphoma. Uh, so either low-grade or high-grade lymphoma, you might need to do lymph node biopsy. Otherwise, uh, serologic tests might, need be, might be needed for infectious causes or autoimmune illnesses. Other is doing bone marrow aspiration in biopsy. Other is the presence of constitutional symptoms with pancytopenia. 
specifically if the patient has a significant constitutional symptoms, you should consider infectious conditions, hematologic malignancies, specifically uh, the lymphomas associated with B symptoms and autoimmune illnesses and HLH as I mentioned earlier. <coughs> So uh, the other uh, abnormalities that might be present associated with pancytopenia and uh, guide our uh, differential diagnosis is, for example, the presence of hypercalcemia with, for example, AKA plus, uh, for example, lytic pore lesions in a patient with multiple myeloma. So if the patient has, for example, uh, cytopenia associated with hypercalcemia and uh, in this condition, you might think of multiple myeloma and uh, guide or uh, direct your investigations towards that. Other are the presence of uh, features of tail lace with an patient having pancytopenia presenting acutely, you might think of acute leukemia. Uh, so these metabolic abnormalities uh, are going to also guide your differential diagnosis. Um, so I think uh, my summary is like in the middle of the slides. Anyways, I can summarize for you. So the things that uh, you should know are the, the cutoff points for uh, the pancytopenia and the definition of pancytopenia. You need to know the mechanism and the cause of pancytopenia to guide your differential diagnosis. And also, um, <coughs> you, need to, um, you need to do initial evaluation of the patient to, uh, to narrow down your differential diagnosis and also to identify emergency conditions which need uh, emergent admission and referral to a hematologist. Other are uh, knowing the specific differential diagnosis and which investigations to order in patients um, presenting with pancytopenia plus organomegalis, pancytopenia plus uh, hypo. Thank you. So I'm going to start from the Salings question. Uh, is it common to get severe uh, neutropenia and hypersplenism related cytopenia? So commonly in hypersplenism related pancytopenia or cytopenia, the cytopenias are not severe. Usually they are either moderate or mild cytopenias. Can low grade NHL cause massive splenomegaly in the absence of lymphadenopathy elsewhere? Uh, yes, it can cause uh, massive splenomegaly in the absence of lymphadenopathy earlier, uh, uh, elsewhere. There are some uh, lymphomas that can only present with uh, either splenom uh, splenomegaly alone. For example, like splenic marginal lymphoma, this is a low grade lymphoma, and patients usually have only splenomegaly and do not have lymphadenopathy elsewhere. Erythrocyte leukemia can also cause uh, splenomegaly without. Uh, lymphadenopathy elsewhere, uh, uh, like uh, this is like PLL, uh, prolifocytic leukemia. Uh, this is like um, so. This low grade lymphomas can cause splenomegaly without causing lymphadenopathy earlier. Even cause we call them splenic lymphomas. The next question is: Is COVID nineteen a risk factor for thrombocytopenia? Yes, it's a risk factor for thrombocytopenia. There are multiple causes of thrombocytopenia in COVID nineteen patients. Patients can either develop diffuse uh, intravascular coagulation, they can develop secondary sepsis with thrombocytopenia, or without the presence of these conditions, they can have uh, thrombocytopenia. So there are different mechanisms of uh, thrombocytopenia in patients with COVID-19. Uh, the next question is, uh, I would like to ask if any threshold for alcohol cons consumption and development of pancytopenia. So uh, normally, uh, Alcohol use, uh, you can use the alcohol use disorder definitions. Uh, that is uh, greater than or equal to two drinks for females and greater than or equal to three drinks for uh, male, depending on the alcohol level. So you can use uh, the threshold, but there is no specific threshold for alcohol consumption in the development of pancytopenia. But usually patients with alcohol use disorder will develop uh, complications either associated with cirrhosis or either associated with uh, vitamin deficiencies. So next question is, uh, he, so he says he has come across a 24-year-old patient who is pancytopenia with all possible causes ruled out. The patient improved with no treatment or a cause of the, or the cause of the pancytopenia. Is that common? Any explanation? <clears throat> so commonly, uh, we have seen patients with, uh, for, I have seen, for example, a patient recently, uh, we have been discussing it, it was controversial, but a female patient who is 26 years old, had pancytopenia associated with the presence of, uh, she had myeloblasts uh, seen uh, from a, a private uh, pathologist, a reliable pathologist who saw the myeloblasts in the bone marrow in the periphery. She had also received uh, transfusions, but uh, after she came to us, her cell count was normal uh, and uh, we didn't see blasts in the bone marrow in the periphery. So there are some case series and case reports uh, saying spontaneous remission of uh, acute leukemia, but Patients usually uh, relapse within 12 months, uh, but 
there are some uh, theories uh, forwarded in these conditions where there is spontaneous remission of acute leukemia. Uh, they have said um, in patients uh, who have received transfusion and have acute leukemia, some patients, their patients might mount immune reactions that attack the blast cells and uh, there might be transient remission. Otherwise, commonly we see this um, in patients taking medications. They haven't reported the medication or the remedy or the traditional medications that they, were, they have been taking. They develop the pancytopias and it recovers. Uh, we also, we can, it can also be present um, where the history might not be clear or the, the, it was not complete and the patient has viral illness prior to the presentation of the pancytopias and the cytopenia resolves. So we see patients uh, where um, the, they develop pancytopenia and there is spontaneous uh, resolution of the pancytopenia. So the next question is, is H. pylori testing required for thrombocytopenia, uh, thrombocytopenic patient? So H. pylori testing specifically is required in ITP if the cause of the pancytopenia, well, no, the thrombocytopenia that we're thinking is ITP, and um, uh, you live in an area where H. pylori is endemic like Ethiopia. So uh, there is association between H. pylori and uh, ITP, so H. pylori testing is required. Uh, treating the H. pylori might, uh, it's sometimes in uh, low count, I don't remember the percentage, but it might improve uh, the ITP. So not in all thrombocytopenic patients, but in patients where you think the cause of the thrombocytopenia is ITP. You do H. pylori testing in endemic areas like Ethiopia. The next question is uh, from Lagao. Uh, which part of the cell will be affected after transfusion of x match blood for the patient who require urgent transfusion while doing peripheral morphology? So, um, for example, uh, I'm not clear about the question, but uh, he's, he's saying, I think, if you're transfusing a patient uh, who requires a transfusion, uh, how does it affect your investigation? I think that's the question that he's asking. So, uh, if you have transfused a patient, for example, with anemia, then um, uh, you might, uh, you, you're going to need to do the peripheral morphology prior to your transfusion because you want to see the morphology of the RBCs, the chromicity and the size of the RBC. So if you have given the patient another person's blood, then it's going to be it's going to affect your morphologic evaluation. And also transfusing the patient with another person uh, packed RBC, for example, is going to uh, affect also your biochemical tests, like for example, measuring the vitamin B12 level and the folate level. So these levels might be affected by transfusion. Uh, when do we consider parvovirus induced pancytopenia and how common is it in our setup? Uh, it's not common even in our setup or uh, internationally. Uh, you consider uh, parvovirus infection in patients uh, who have complete aplasia in the bone marrow aspiration. So you, you might not be able to see it. There are patients that are predisposed, for example, patients with CLL, uh, patients who are immunosuppressed uh, or other hematologic malignancies are going to be predisposed to uh, parvovirus 19 infection. In this condition, you're going to suspect the presence of parvovirus because when you do bone marrow aspiration, there is aplasia. And also in the RBC precursors, there are specific signs that you see, like a dog ear appearance. There is something called a dog ear appearance in the RBC precursors called the normoblast, where you see delayed maturation of the nucleus and also blaming of the cytoplasm. So you, there are morphologic findings that you see in the bone marrow. But you cannot suspect it from uh, just the clinical presentation. It's not, it requires a high... Uh, uh, threshold of suspicion to, con uh, to consider parvovirus, but there are patients who are predisposed to developing it. Another question is, you no, know, the role of bone marrow exam in megaloblastic anemia, especially in elderly, where MDS is a competing differential diagnosis? That's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, in megaloblastic anemia, uh, so MDS can cause macrovalocytes, hypersegmented neutrophils, uh, it can cause similar changes uh, as megaloblastic anemia, uh, but you, uh, you, might, you can use uh, biochemical tests, uh, serum levels of this uh, uh, methyl myelolic acid and homocysteine levels to, uh, to see the diagnosis of megaloblastic anemia. And also you look at, for example, in a elderly patient where uh, you're going to consider MDS, then you're going to consider MDS as a differential diagnosis and keep that in your mind while you're investigating the patient. So you can do this biochemical test and rule out megaloblastic anemia. The other is, um, for example, in, in MDS, uh, dysplasia might not only be present in the neutrophils, the dysplasia can be present in megakaryocytes, the dysplasia can be present in RBCs. So that is another thing that you can consider. Uh, the other is treatment trial can also be helpful in younger patients. You can uh, 
start uh, treatment trial for megaloblastic anemia in patients responding, and also with uh, appropriate clinical scenarios where the cause of the megaloblastic anemia is also clear from the history. So further investigations, uh, your differential diagnosis based on age, the presence of dysplasia in other cell lines. So when do we say neutropenic fever? Uh, so we have talked about the threshold for neutropenia and there are specific temperatures that you need to consider. So a central uh, temperature measurement of 38.3, uh, one measurement or uh, uh, repeated measurement with a temperature of 38 is going to define uh, neutropenic fever. Uh, so there are uh, guidelines, textbooks to define what neutropenic fever is. Uh, when to consider neutropenic fever, which patients are predisposed to neutropenic fever, but the threshold numbers are available and the temperatures are 38.3 and 38 two measurements and 38.3 one measurement. Uh, the next question is by radiate. What is the first line treatment for neutropenic fever in our country and how we, how we proceed with antibiotics? So <clears throat> in patients with either acute leukemias or uh, um, aplastic anemias presenting with neutropenic fever, our first line treatment is uh, antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics like CFP. We use CFP, we have CFP. Uh, and uh, additional vancomycin is going to be guided by specific clinical scenarios. For example, in patients having uh, the focus for the neutropenic fever uh, being the lung, skin, mucosa, um, and those having hemod hemodynamic uh, instability are going to require addition of vancomycin. And then subsequently, you're going to follow the patient uh, and then. Uh, if the fever persists, uh, you might need to start antifungals, you might need to change antibiotics, and you might need to further investigate the patient. Uh, when did we give prophylaxis for neutropenic fever? Uh, what will be the antibiotic choice? Um, so specific disease scenario is important in this condition. So where uh, prophylaxis is going to be needed in patients where we think uh, they are predisposed to neutropenic fever, meaning they are going to have a prolonged neutropenia greater than seven days. So Patients with acute leukemia, patients uh, with lymphomas re receiving chemotherapy and having uh, severe neutropenia, uh, we're going to uh, give them prophylaxis antibiotics. Commonly, we use here is uh, manociprofloxacin. We use uh, we, we use a drug antibiotics and also antifungal and antiviral prophylaxis based on the presence of uh, past history of viral infections are going to be started. If you need to further uh, read on this, there are guidelines um, on uh, neutropenic fever, or they are also present in textbooks. Are, this is a detailed discussion, like choice of antibiotics, initial choice. Uh, we have guidelines to guide our initial choice, but further antibiotics, for example, are going to be guided by your culture results, uh, your uh, institutional um, uh, um, anti micro microbial growth, uh, microbial status. So uh, it's a vast uh, discussion, but at least I, have, I think I have given you an idea. The other is what is the treatment of hyperactive malarial spleromegaly? We, we give them uh, chloroquine weekly and we follow these patients. Uh, some patients might respond, some patients might not respond, but we follow the patients, give them this anti-malarial drug and uh, uh, look for complications associated with uh, the cytopenias. How common is miliary TB causing pancytopenia? I am not sure about the number. Uh, I guess we can both look it up. So I'm not sure about uh, how common miliary TB is passed, but in our country, at least compared to other countries, um, uh, TB is uh, much more common in our country. So we, we see patients, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, the disseminated TB causing um, pancytopenia. I have seen two patients at least uh, in the past two years. So liver cirrhosis related to pancytopenia because it causes portal hypertension, splenomegaly, hyper, hyperspinism associated. Uh, so what about tropical diseases like Leishmaniasis? Uh, I don't understand the question. Uh, it, it causes pancytopenia uh, uh, with visceral Leishmaniasis. I don't know what the question is, but we see patients um, uh, commonly in ID attachments or in ID clinics. Uh, we see patients with visceral leishmaniasis and cytopenias. So anti-TB should be initiated in patients with disseminated TB and pancytopenia. Then we're going to give them support if they have severe neutropenia and develop, for example, superimposed infections, they are going to need antibiotics. They might need transfusion support. Otherwise, you need to initiate anti-TB. So uh, how common is it to have pancytopenia in, in acute leukemia? Depends on the type of the acute leukemia. 
But false cytopenia might be present in 30 to 50 percent of patients present in with acute leukemia. Antibiotic reference for neutropenic fever is already mentioned. Uh, any association with heart failure, like I've said earlier, congestive hepatopathy and splenomegaly can occur in patients with right sided heart failure and they can develop uh, hyperspinism and sequestration of the blood components. So maybe uh, I will try to answer uh, Radet's question and Adelaide's question. Uh, Radet's question would be common cause of pancytopenia with macrocytic anemia, other than megaloblastic anemia, and how to approach them. Uh, <clears throat> so the approach is just going to be long, but there are other causes of macrocytic anemia, other than uh, megaloblastic anemia, like drugs, ketotrixate, the anti uh, seizure medications like phenytoin and phenobarb, um, uh, like I've said, alcohol associated uh, macrocytic anemia. Uh, are uh, differential, some differential diagnosis. It can also uh, be present with mild myelodysplastic syndrome. So these are the differential uh, diagnosis. Uh, the approach is just going to be uh, very long, but of course it's going to include your history, your physical examination, and uh, laboratory tests, uh, including uh, depending on the presentation of the patient up to the level of bone marrow aspiration. Uh, the last question is what could be differential for a 25-year-old woman on her first postpartal day presenting with severe anemia and thrombocytopenia? <clears throat> so in these patients, uh, <clears throat> first you have to think of uh, pregnancy or uh, pregnancy-related conditions like eclampsia, preeclampsia, help uh, should be considered uh, for the cause of uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia. Usually these uh, patients have a life-threatening condition. So Either rasputin is a help, eclampsia or preeclampsia. Patients can have severe anemia, thrombocytopenia in the postpartal period. Uh, the other are, uh, for example, they might have retained placental tissue and they might develop dif uh, diffuse intravascular coagulation. They might develop sepsis and, uh, as, uh, of course, sepsis in associated diffuse intravascular coagulation and develop severe anemia and thrombocytopenia. Otherwise, other differential diagnosis like uh, these are the pregnancy related factors like uh, eclampsia, preeclampsia, help syndrome. DIC associated with sepsis in retained placental tissue or, or postpartal infections. Otherwise, you need to think of other differential, the differential diagnosis that you've mentioned for the cause of pancytopenia or bicytopenia, the ones that we have discussed uh, until now. Commonly, we usually see patients in the postpartal period in black line with um, these are the common causes that we see DIC uh, and also HELP syndrome. and uh, we also see patients with megaloblastic anemia. So they have been pre pregnant repeatedly. They are multiparous and uh, they don't have uh, appropriate follow-up. And also they don't take the folate supplementation during pregnancy. And we usually see uh, patients having uh, bicytopenia, postpartal period, and the cause is megaloblastic anemia. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Blue Hills for giving me this chance uh, to speak on in this topic. And also, um, I would like to thank the participants for uh, hoping, I'm hoping attentively listening to my, uh, my talk. Thank you.